Good to see those of you who are here. Okay, uh, and Beverly does continue to uh, heal from her. Uh, she had to have her gallbladder removed this last week. And so she's home. She's healing from that. Uh, I made good friends with their puppy. They have a great Dane puppy named Zoe. And uh, I went over a couple of times while, while, while uh, she was in the hospital and Shane was with her to take care of the dog. And the dog didn't want nothing to do with me. Right? She doesn't know who I am. She's still a, she's as big as my hound dog, but she's still only like three months old. I mean, she's, you know, three days is huge. So I'd seen this guy on YouTube who, who goes to, you know, animal shelters and kind of brings, you know, abused dogs out of their shells, so to speak. And one of the things he does, I learned something new, is if he's got a really, you know, a, a dog that's cowering in the back corner of the kennel, kind of growl on her or whatever, you know, that doesn't want anything to do with humans because they've been abused is he'll turn his back to them, he'll walk backwards into the kennel and sit down in front of the dog. And then before you know it, the dog is, you know, sniffing their ears and licking them and all that kind of stuff and crawling on their lap. So I'm going to try that. You know what? It works. Because I want to let that dog, the keeper in the kitchen when they're gone, keep her cages in the kitchen so she's got room. I, I want to keep my dog in the kitchen because they didn't do the cupboards. But <laughs> anyway... So I go look around the kitchen, she's like, one nothing to be, and it goes and hides in the, in the back corner of the bedroom. So that's what I did. I just walked backwards and sat right in front of her, and pretty soon she's in my lap, and I'm the greatest thing since sliced bread. So it works, okay? All right. So uh, one, one of my goals, uh, maybe one of my jobs, you know, self-assigned self, uh, tasks as, as your pastor is to challenge your thinking. Or to challenge your personal theology at times. And so, in that, I hope I do a good job. So, if I leave you puzzled or wondering what's going on or what am I talking about, then I know I've done something right. So, I have a riddle for you. Okay? This is a, this is a biblical riddle. Let me make sure I get it correct here. Yeah. I have two sheets of paper in my hand with printing on them. What do these two sheets of paper represent? That's too easy. It's a riddle. A paradox. A pair of doctors. Ah! I thought of that the other day sitting there at my, at my desk. I'm like, ah, paradox. Well, because we're going to look at a paradox today at the end of Matthew chapter 16. But before we do that, we need to define what a pair of, not, not a pair of pieces of paper, right? Not a pair of Google Docs or Word Docs. I use Google because it's free. Microsoft charges an annual licensing fee, and I don't want to give it to them, so it's all the same, really. A paradox, P-A-R-A-D-O-X. What is a paradox? Well, according to uh, Merriam-Webster's online dictionary, one of the definitions of paradox is this. I'm just going to quote it word for word. A statement that is seemingly contradictory or opposed to common sense and yet is perhaps true. A self-contradictory statement that at first seems true. Or an argument that apparently derives self-contradictory conclusions by valid deduction from acceptable premises. Ooh, that's I like the first one, it's a little shorter. A statement that is seemingly contradictory or opposed to common sense, and yet is perhaps true. Did anybody think of a paradox in the Bible? It's in the end of Matthew chapter 16, if you can't. So, previously in, in Matthew 16... Uh, there was a lot of little, a lot of big things that happened. Not little things happened in that chapter. You've got uh, starts with the Pharisees and Sadducees seeking uh, some kind of super duper miraculous sign, even though it was happening in front of them all the time from Jesus, right? And Jesus teaching about the leaven or the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. In other words, the false teachings. Okay. Then you have Peter, who confesses Jesus as the Christ. And Jesus tells him, you are the little rock, right? Remember that? Okay. And then, 
you've got Jesus beginning to teach them clearly that he is going to be arrested, tried, crucified, executed, right? And raised on the third day. And in that same beginning of that teaching, you've got Peter who one moment, you know, one day before, or maybe an hour before, I don't know, could have been in the same 30-minute conversation with these people. Who knows? You got Peter on the one hand, who's who's the little rock, right? Who's who's gonna you know get the church started, right? And then you've got Jesus saying to him, "Satan, get behind me! You don't have in mind the things of, of the Father." Okay. So now Jesus then is going to teach all the disciples that he's got with him a paradox. He's going to say something to him that on its face, doesn't seem to make logical sense. But he's preparing his disciples, and it's not just for them, it's also for us. Because Jesus is, is teaching them what it is to understand what his kingdom, his kingdom is all about. Now, if you take any other earthly kingdom throughout the, the history of the world, We'll include the United States. I know we have a president, but we must have a king, right? Okay, it's not much different. Our kingdoms are self-serving, are they not? Look at, I mean, go through the history of the world. You know, the king of France and the king of England and the king of Germany, you know, and the king of this and the king of that. They were, for the most part, self-serving, as are a good share of our presidents over history, not, not just a current one. Okay? They're self-serving. Jesus' kingdom is all about self-sacrifice. Which seems to fly in the face of logic. I want you to turn to your Bibles if you haven't already in Matthew chapter 16. Let's look at verses 21 through 28 because I want to include last week's passage. From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. We looked at that last week. Now Jesus goes right into teaching this paradox. Then Jesus said to his disciples, verse 24, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now he's just told them he's going to be what? He's going to suffer. He's going to be condition. Clearly he's going to be crucified. So he tells them right here, you're going to have to take up your cross and follow me. And we'll get into that in a minute, okay? Because that really gets misconstrued. Verse 25, for whoever desires to save his life, here's our paradox, whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Paradox, right? For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of His Father with His angels, and then He will reward each according to His works. Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. That's quite the teaching. Now, did you see the paradox in there? I pointed it out to you, right? Whoever desires to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake. Jesus said, not mine, okay? For my sake, will find it. That seems illogical, doesn't it? You mean you're going to lose your life if you try to save it, and, and if you give up your life for Christ, and lose your life to Christ, you're going to find life? So, to... You know, the unspiritual to a non believer somebody who doesn't believe who Jesus is and that what he has done and who he is today, that makes no sense. Yeah, it probably didn't make much sense to, their, to the disciples either. Because we'll see as they continue on up to 
the point of his crucifixion and subsequent resurrection, they were still looking to find their life short of dying. Remember in the Garden of the Gethsemane scene where Jesus is getting arrested. Peter's not ready to sacrifice himself. He's not ready to give up his life for Jesus, even though he said he would. What does he do? He pulls out a sword and tries to chop off the, the head of the high priest servant. Servant ducks, loses an ear. Right? And then later on that, that early morning, late night, early morning, Jesus begins to deny Peter, the, or excuse me, Peter begins to deny Jesus. Who better get that one right? Jesus never denied anybody. Peter begins to deny Jesus three times, right? Or how about, even prior to that, James and John and their mother who are going to come to Jesus and say, hey, we want to sit at your right and left hand in the kingdom. They're not thinking the kingdom of heaven. They're thinking of the kingdom of men. They're looking for political power. So Jesus here, he, he uses a paradox directly on the heels of rebuking Peter. He starts with this statement. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And this is misunderstood so many times. So maybe perhaps today I may challenge your thinking on this statement. Take up your cross does not mean your personal bur burdens are yours to bear alone. I'm going to say that again. Taking up your cross does not mean your personal burdens are yours and yours alone to carry. If they were, what's the point in believing in Jesus? What's the point in a Savior if the things that have happened to you or the things you've done, right, through the history of your life are yours and yours alone to carry like an overweight backpack. And I think I've used that physical illustration below. I'm talking burdens. It could be anything from your health or your family's health. Family strife. Abuses. Persecutions. Your personal sin. Your addictions. All those things, right? It's, it, I, I, I've heard it, not necessarily so much here, but I've heard it before. Somebody gets, you know, cancer or something like that. Oh, it's my cross to bear. No, it's not. Yeah, you got it, right? But it's not your cross to bear, and that's not what Jesus is saying here. You put it into the context of what he says, okay? And he says something completely different. Even, even John eventually understands this in 1 John 1, 9, where he says, if we confess our sins... So, sin is a burden to bear, is it not? If we confess our sins, He, the Father, is what? You know what? Faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and then what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, there's no more burden of sin. It is not your cross to bear. That's not what Jesus is saying here in Matthew chapter 16. Okay? So, hopefully I'm challenging your thinking on that. Your burdens are not yours to bear and bear alone. The cross, however, symbolizes death. And to take up your cross is to drop all those burdens and die to yourself. Sometimes, we as people, I've done it, I bet you most of you have done it if you're totally honest with yourselves, which most of us are not, okay? Including myself. I'm not always totally honest with myself. All right? Most of us, at some point, have tried to hold on to some kind of burden we need to let go of. It's like we're codependent upon it. You see this happen in, in abusive marriage relationships. Usually the husband is abusive of the wife. Sometimes it's, you know, the tables are turned. Do you see this in abusive relationships where the husband is abusive to the wife and the wife stays even though there is opportunity to leave? Whether it's staying out of fear or that's all she knows. Oftentimes the, the abused wife was abused as a child. And so 
Sometimes we hold on to those burdens and we don't let go because we're comfortable in them. Comfortable in them. That's all we know. But we don't need to do that. We can die to ourself by giving ourselves wholly and totally to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died to himself. He wasn't abused as a child, of course. Well, I don't think he was. But prior to being born as a baby boy, Jesus in the manger to, to, you know, to Mary and Joseph as his stepdad and all that kind of stuff, and the wise men showing up at some point, you know, and the, well, the shepherds at night, and all that kind of stuff. Prior to that, he had to give up a position co-equal with the Father. Co-equal, does that even make sense? Equals good enough, right? He had to give up everything. He had to become one of he had to become one of us. Why would you do that? I wouldn't give up my position for all of you. As a pastor, I will, but you know, me and my way of thinking is uh-uh. You know, because Jesus is like, I know what's happened, what happens down there, and I know how people treat each other, and I know what's, you know, I see that they skin their knees and, and get head colds and, and the flu and well, they didn't have COVID-19 then because it wasn't engineered yet. Anyway, um, oh, that's going to get me banned from YouTube right there. I actually had that happen. Okay, I've got to tell you a story. So I got a little notification from YouTube that in February of 2021, in one of my messages that I get was recorded and put, and put on YouTube, um, uh, they, they disagreed with my stance on something medical. Right? And so they removed that sermon video from my YouTube channel. It's like they disagreed with what the Bible said. They just, you know, I probably said something bad about vaccines or something. I don't know what it was or the origin of COVID. It's like, come on, YouTube, get over it. So much for the First Amendment. Anyway, the First Amendment didn't save my soul. Jesus Christ saved my soul. And Jesus Christ died to himself and he gave everything up for us. That's what he means by taking up our cross, right? By denying yourself and taking up your cross. Not packing up all your burdens and carrying them with you so you can say, oh look, what was me? I need sympathy. We are supposed to pray for each other burdens, but we're supposed to share our burdens with each other. Because remember, pain shared is pain divided, right? Joy shared is joy multiplied. One of my favorite little quotes. So if Jesus did that, and if Jesus is willing to give everything up, he's saying to us, we are to die to ourselves and give everything to him. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. It sounds contradictory, but it's not. There's that paradox again. See, if you die with all the wealth in the world, okay, so we can, you know, we can think, you know, we can even say it loud, some of the you know, wealthiest people in the world. Most of them look pretty miserable, don't they? Okay? But if they die with all the wealth in the world, or at least all the wealth that they can muster up, with billions and billions of dollars in assets, real estate around the world, a yacht on every continent, right? A fleet of private jets, okay? A new wife every 10 years. Some of them seem to do. If you die with all that, how, well, how wealthy will you be in the grave? Hmm. Even if you could take all the money in the world and bury it in a casket with you, what does it really mean? Dead is dead, right? How about if you rule the world? We've had people throughout world history that have you know, attempted to conquer the entire world, so they thought they could do. Adolf Hitler was one of them, right? If you rule the world, who will be obedient to you after you die? Hmm? Okay, so they might take your carcass. 
what I'm going to call it, your corpse, your carcass, embalm you, put you in an open casket or inside this, you know, glass tomb thing, so, you know, and lie in a state, they call it, right? Lying in a state. So people can come by and spit on you. I mean, uh, you know, do whatever, right? But at that moment that you're dead, are you in charge of the world anymore? Or you're part of the world? No. No. Let's bring it back down to a more realistic level. What happens when we try to be in charge of our own little part of the world? My way or the highway. Maybe it's in your family. Hmm? You try to put your wife and your children or your husband and your children under your thumb or thumbs, right? And make things your way all the time. When you die, is, is things going to be your way anymore? No. Probably not. Depending on what part of the country you grew up in. Nobody's going to be a beat into you after you die. What happens if now, today, while you're alive, and you still have the breath of life in you? What happens if you give up, give up all that? Hmm? What would happen if you relinquish control of your life, of yourself, if you relinquish control of yourself and your ideas and your ways of doing things, and if you relinquish that, relinquish is to give it up, right? I don't know, there's a word, I had to look that one up. I'm like, I need a, a word that means give up control. Relinquish was that word. What happens if you relinquish control of your life to Jesus today while you're alive? What will you gain? For eternity. You'll gain everything, right? I want you to turn your Bibles quick like to 1 Peter. Well, maybe not quick. It might take you a while to find it. It's kind of small. And I didn't put a I didn't put a post-it over my Bible to find it fast. So. James. There it is. After James. 1 Peter chapter 4. There we go. Starting verse 12. We'll read through the end of the chapter 4. Peter is writing to New Testament believers. He's writing to the church. Okay. And they have been suffering persecution. I think persecution to the point of death based upon the way he writes and what he says. He says this, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. Yes, because at this point in history there were Christians being burned at the stake in the Roman Empire. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings that when His glory is revealed you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, not cursed, blessed are you, what was I? for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. In other words, take up your cross and follow Him. Die to yourself. Taking up your cross is not actually a burden. It is the relinquishing of burdens. So that even if you are persecuted for your faith, you can count yourself blessed. Because Jesus was persecuted for who he is. Was he not? You bet. Again, verse 14. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed. But on your part, he is glorified. What's Peter saying here? It's almost a paradox, almost, isn't it? People curse you because of the name of Jesus. But He glorifies you because of that. Verse 15. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, 
In other words, let none of us suffer as a criminal. Because if we do, then we deserve it, right? But there's even more. He goes beyond that. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or a busybody in other people's business. Or other people's matters. Oh, wow. That's, that's kind of a wide range, isn't it? Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. For the time has come. The time has come today. I believe it's certainly in the Christian church in the United States of America. I'm not going to talk about any other country. I'm going to talk about my country. Okay? For the time has come for what? What does it say? Judgment. Oh, let's say that again. The time has come for what? Judgment. Judgment. Okay? To begin where? In Washington, D.C.? In the U.N.? Oh, no. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to Him in doing good as to a faithful Creator. If we suffer wrongly at the hands of someone else, as natural human beings, as sinful human beings, what is our natural reaction? To fire right back, isn't it? To fight right back. Now I'm not saying if you were attacked in your house by somebody with a gun, yes, you should defend yourself. Kind of like that guy did here in California a couple weeks ago, even though they took his carry permit away. Which doesn't make any sense to me. That's not what no, that's not what he's saying here. If you suffer because of the name of Jesus Christ, because you are a Christian, then you can rejoice. That's not a burden. Because we have committed ourselves to God. We have committed ourselves to our faithful Creator who is Jesus Christ. Peter's writing here is a tremendous contrast from his reactions recorded in Matthew 16. Right? In Matthew 16, he says, Jesus, oh, you're never going to suffer for me. I won't let that happen. Now, Peter's saying, so many years down the road, now Peter is really saying just the opposite. Rejoice in suffering. Give yourself to Jesus Christ. Are you going to suffer for that? Yes. But your suffering is temporary. It is not something you have to carry with you through eternity. How many athletes or former athletes do I have in here? Raise your hand. If you played ball of some sort, or, you know, whether it was you, or you danced, any dancers in here? I know there's some dancers in here. Come on, raise your hand. It's not a Baptist church. It's okay. Right? <laughs> Dancing is exercise. That's why I don't do it. Okay? If you ever if you ever competed in anything, you had to practice. You had to suffer. Oftentimes, uh, you know, well, you know, the army would call it, you know, in certain schools, hell week. So would Football teams have heard that same term, right? Hell a week, right? If you want to be victorious, you're going to have to suffer first, right? If you want to make the podium, you're going to have to work hard, you're going to have to suffer, right? Well, guess what? We're going to have to expect we're going to have to suffer for being Christians. And we should not walk around with our heads down. Ooh. 
person made fun of me because I believe in the Bible. We should rejoice. Those people made fun of Jesus too. And he knew it front to back. Because it all came from him. We can look forward. We gotta look forward beyond our cross that we think we gotta bear. Remember, that's I want you to try to get that out of your head. We can look forward to a glorious eternal life that is far greater than anything we can drill up in this life. You can have all the wealth, we can name them right now. George Soros. Okay. George Soros, Bill Gates, Donald Trump, okay, and all these other super rich guys. Yes. The owner of Grocery Outlet, whoever that is, he's probably got money. Right. Certainly the owner of Dollar General. I mean, they put stores everywhere. He's got to have some money. Okay? We can have all that, and that's nothing. It's all smoke and mirrors. It's paper. It's all mansions that will someday fall down. It's all planes that might fall out of the sky. It's all yachts that will sink. It's all fancy limousines that still get flat tires. Nothing compared to what God has for us. See, Jesus transcends all of our political ambitions, regardless of how small or large. He transcends all goods. Jeff Bezos has nothing on Jesus. If you don't know who that is, that's the guy that owns Amazon. They sell everything. I will admit to shopping there once in a while. Okay? Jesus transcends all positive attention that the world can put upon us. And he transcends all negative attention that the world can put upon us. He transcends all the traffic of this world. If you have not realized, your pastor is a motorhead. I like things with wheels that make noise. I like things that go bang. Not cars, I don't want my cars to go bang. But I like guns and I like things that go bang. Those are my two things, right? Guess what? They're all junk in comparison. I can spend all of my money and somebody else's money as well on the bank's money. Um, I used to buy a new truck every four years. Whether I had the money for it or not. That's how I used to live, right? I just work some more overtime. I used to drive my wife crazy. Hey, look, I brought home another payment. Okay? Because I was wrapped up in the trappings of this world. We used to compete at work to who could have the newest three-quarter ton diesel pickup truck. Except they kept getting more expensive and more expensive. And now I was like, I can't afford it anymore. I'm going to quit that. But Jesus goes beyond all that. When we're willing to give that up, and we're willing to give up control of our lives, and that's the, that's the cross that a lot of us talk about bearing. When we're willing to give up that control and die to ourselves, then we can do. Then we can we can put ourselves in a place where Paul says, "For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain." Right? Now he's speaking about actually physically living to Christ, and that dying, physically dying, he would gain eternity. But in the meantime, right? In the meantime, when we die to ourselves, we truly can live for Christ. Paul had to do the same thing. Remember, he had a paradigm shift. You know what a paradigm shift is? It's not two coins in your pocket separating your, you know, <laughs> right to left pocket. It's not a paradigm shift. Okay? That's plain words. Paradigm shift is a total change in thinking and direction. Paul was riding on his little donkey, or whatever he's on, from Jerusalem to Damascus, with warrants of arrest for Jewish Christians. Hmm. And what happened to him? Oh, he had a paradigm shift. Right? 
He had to die to himself. And that death to himself began when Jesus stopped him on the road. Blinded him, knocked him off his donkey, so to speak. Right? And sent him on a totally different path. A paradigm shift. Paul, at the time Saul, died to himself that day. And continued to die to himself. Clear up till the day he was executed in Rome. And what did he gain? He gained the kingdom of heaven. Same with Peter. Peter had to die to himself. Peter had to go from the, this will never happen to you, right? And the, and the, you know, and the subsequent, I'll go to the death with you, Jesus, right? And the, I don't know him. I don't know. I don't know who that is. Three times, right? He had to go from that, from the fearful man, to the spiritually bold man. He had died himself. We must do the same. We must embrace the paradox. That's why I put it in really bold, big letters. I know you can't read it from out there unless you've got like bionic eyes. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Let's close the message in prayer. Father, we thank you again for this day and for the week that is coming and for whatever you bring our way because we don't know. We thank you that we can lay our burdens to you to the cross that we think we got to bear. We can, we can drop that at the cross of Christ. Die to ourselves, to our desires, and follow your path. The path which leads to eternal glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah.